the first step is we're gonna go ahead and clean this black oxidization off of the findings. And undesigned findings are plated with a 0.999 silver and a 24 karat gold. And then we oxidize them to give them this blackened look. And we wanna clean them thoroughly before we put the resin on. You'll need some toothpicks and some Q-tips and you'll need a little bit of rubbing alcohol. Go ahead and put your Q-tip right inside of the rubbing alcohol. Take your bezel, just smear that around on the inside, getting those inside crevices and those corners. And you can see that the blackening is coming off. Clean the upper lip. Come on in here where the bail is. I'm doing the outsides. Back side. You also want to have a wet wipe that you then scrub that down. It just removes all of that blackening. For the inside here, just take your toothpick and your wet wipe go along in those inside edges. And go ahead and clean up all of the bezels for this class. Inside the package of crystal clay, you will have the crystal clay itself, part A and part B. It also comes with an applicator and has a little bit of beeswax on the top, which makes it possible for you to pick up chitons that are embedded in the clay. And then it also comes with a pair of gloves. I don't like these gloves. They're very hard for me to use. My hands are smaller, um, so I tend to use a different type of glove. I have some latex gloves that I like to use. And there is a trick for getting as many life as much life as you can out of these um, out of these gloves. So I'm just gonna take a moment to tell you how to do that. When you're pulling the gloves on and off of your hands, it's really nice to have your hands be nice and dry and not have any moisture. So what I like to do is uh, use a little bit of baby powder. I put a little piece of plastic down on my work surface and then I'm just fully coating my hands with the baby powder. Um, before I put them into the glove. So I'm just kind of going in and making sure that it's on in between my fingers, the, pipe, the baby powder. So once it's all on, then I can go ahead and put my gloves on. And then let's just say after I've uh, finished using my crystal clay, let me show you this is now, this is so much easier to get off because I can just pull on the fingers and then pull on the whole piece and then my hand easily slides out so I can continue to use these over and over again. So that's a nice little trick. With your gloves on, fingers all powdered first, you're going to want to pull off equal size balls of part A and part B. I like to have a business card on the ready or a piece of plastic. These business cards are also covered with tape and that allows me to place the clay onto here and not have it stick to the surface. The amount of clay that you pull off is dependent on what size of buzzle you're going to use and this is going to just take some estimating and practicing on your part. Uh, to figure out exactly how much clay to use and mix per bezel. You might have a lot of projects going at once, so you would pull, pull off more. Go ahead and open up the part A. I'm just gonna try to keep that sticker on so that I can always identify what part is part A, but I can tell you that the one that's darker is always part B, and the color is always part A, and I'm working with white. So if I was working with black, it would be black on A, and this would be the same. And we also offer brown, and so A and then B. So open up part A from the kit, and we're going to pinch off a small ball. 
of the clay. Again, dependent on how much you're going to be needing for your project, I highly recommend that you uh, just continually add more if you need it um, versus doing up a huge batch and having the pressure of having to use all of it. So I have a nice size ball there of A. I'm not going to close that up yet. I just want to make sure that I have uh, plenty. And then we're going to open up the package for part B. Pinch off a small ball about equivalent in size and let's see how we did. So this right here, the part B, this is the actual epoxy that we're gonna be working with and that is the reason why we use gloves all together when we're mixing this clay so that this isn't having direct contact onto our skin. This part is neutral and then once these two activate, it then becomes neutral and you can take your gloves off. I don't have enough of part B, so I'm just pinching off another little small ball and I'm roll it in the palms of my hand and see if I have equal sized balls. You want it to be somewhat equal. This isn't as exact as it is with resin, the two part epoxy resin, um, but you still want it to be somewhat equal in size. So that is approximately equal in size. I'm going to show you how you go ahead and to prevent this from drying out over time as you use it, you'll want to make sure that you close this back up and try to keep it as airtight as possible I'm using my little sticker. To close this back up, you can also use a little bit of tape. And then the thing that's different, when I go to close this up, I don't put these back in the same container. I'm gonna use two separate ones. Just This is just to prevent these two from getting any kind of contact and potentially having some way in which they can be activated and possibly harden. So I have learned to put it into its own little Ziploc. Um, I place it inside of there and then I'm just pulling out any excess air before I zip this back up. And then I'll go ahead and do part A the same way. Closing it up. Putting it in its own little ziplock. Holding it up getting all that excess air out, and then sealing it shut. So now I have my A and B wrapped up and preserved for next time. If I come back to this and this is hardened because I haven't used it for a long time, I can put it in some warm water, and just drop it right in the warm water and let it sit for a good five minutes. You might wanna continually refresh to make sure it's nice and warm, and this will come back up to room temperature and will be softer to work with. It does have a, a shelf life though, so you might want to, you have to take that into consideration when you're using that product. So now we're ready to mix our part A and our part B. Once you have equal sized balls, go ahead and take the balls and with your gloves on, slowly or quickly start to blend these two parts together. So the white is the easiest to work with. The black tends to get uh, all over my fingers more uh, because there's so much pigment in the black color. And so it'll tend to get all over my gloves and leave little residue. But the white is one of the easier ones to work with. So mix the clay together fully until you have no more modeling and it's very well blended. And once it's all mixed together, I'm going to put it back onto my little card. And now that's activated so I can take my gloves off. 
before I do this, I like to use a little wet wipe just to make sure that my gloves are all nice and clean because I'm wanting to make sure that I can reuse this, these gloves over and over again and prevent um, having a lot of waste. So I will pull at the fingers. This is the trick with that powder. And then the whole glove comes off easily and, and not inside out. Pull up my fingers. And now I have a nice pair of gloves that I can use the next time. The clay is now activated so I can handle this with my hands. Before I do though, um, I might want to you might want to wipe down your hands because you have baby powder all over them. It's not going to affect the clay at all because I'm working with the white, but if you were working with the brown or the black, it would show up a little bit more of that baby powder from your hands. So now I'm nice and dry, and I can take my crystal clay and rolling it into a nice smooth ball and I'm ready to do the next step. For this next step, we were actually gonna put our, um, our gloves back on, but I wanted to show you, just remind you that we're going to be using um, the second formula on my Love Cheat Sheet. So I made these little balls of clay and then I already pre-colorized them and built out a whole little cheat sheet for myself. So this is gonna take uh, one tiny toothpick of the blue and one two large toothpicks of the white. So let me just show you what that quantity is going to look like. So the formula is based off of using a ball of crystal clay about the size of a large blueberry. So pick off or peel off or pinch off um, a small blueberry size of your mixed crystal clay to make uh, a ball that's gonna be about that. Because I, I know I wanna fill more than one bezel, I will triple this formula and have a variety of balls approximately all the same size. So let's say if I was gonna triple this formula, I would have, well that's pretty much, that's pretty much three balls worth, let's just say. So I would actually put in six and six um, versus just the two and then I can have a larger ball to make the whole entire formula and it should come out about that size about that color. All right, so let me show you what it looks like to put a tiny toothpick and a large toothpick. So we had our colorants that we squeezed out onto a piece of plastic. And this is, whoa, I had some blue already on the tip of that one. So I don't know if you saw that, but this is a large toothpick worth. So showing you know, you're gonna put on about that much and that's considered a large toothpick. And then a small toothpick or a tiny toothpick would be just a tiny, tiny bit. So this formula is gonna be six and six. So let me go ahead and put my gloves back on and we're going to mix then to uh, create this color. So I have my gloves put on. My hands are very well powdered and I'm ready to mix my formula to try to create a color that's very similar to that. So I'm going to make a nice flat patty with my uh, clay. And this is just so that I can easily put all my color on there. So six tiny toothpicks. Let's just say this is a tiny toothpick. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I have a designated, just a blue one and a designated white one. So we're doing six or large of the white. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so I like to just place it all on there because then I can kind of just keep and control the amount of um, the colorant and where it goes. So I'm just gonna fold it in half. And this, this helps it so that I get less of that colorant on my hands. And you will get it on your hands. It, this is such a light color that it won't be quite as intense. So you can already see that that colorant is mixing together. If you just mixed your clay, 
um, it's going to be a little, it could be a little bit sticky and it'll um, stick to your gloves a lot more. So if it's really sticking a lot to your gloves, you can stop and uh, wait for about 10 minutes until this sets up a little more uh, firm and it'll be easier to work with. So we're mostly using the gloves during this because we don't want to get any of that um, opaque colorant onto our fingers. It'll stain our hands. So I'm mixing this up and I can see that um, I'm not fully blended, but I know that I don't have enough of that blue. Um, so I'll go back in and add a couple of tiny toothpicks. I had really tiny toothpicks of the blue. Let's just start with just two, because this is such, um, this is so potent. Let's see how we do. Um, so I have those in there, roll them up in there. Hey. You can see that once you start to uh, have it sticking to your fingers, it's super easy to continue to have it stick. So you might want to stop. I'm just going to take a little break and uh, use a little wet wipe to wipe my fingers down so that I don't have so much crystal clay on there. And then I'll continue to mix the clay. So it looks like I still don't have enough. I don't know. I think I just didn't put enough of that blue. But you can see I'm, a, I'm pretty much the next color down. Um, I'm even light for that. It might have been that, um, you know, when I first did the formula, I had a smaller ball size. You can see I fudged a little bit on that um, and said, hey, yeah, it's like three. So if that's the case, just go ahead and um, just keep on asking, adding more blue until you get to the color that you like. When you're doing this as a production, you can actually weigh your clay and then you'll know you have exact proportions. All right, so I continued to add more blue until I got very similar to the color that I um, originally was after. It's a little light, but this, it'll get us to what we needed to do. Um, so go ahead and use your wet wipe to wipe down your gloves because you're going to want to reuse these. So get any of the crystal clay or the colorant off that you can so that they're nice and clean. Um, pull at the fingertips and um, remove the gloves, keeping them right side out so that you can easily reuse these again and again. If they're getting stuck on your wrist, just go ahead and release that off over there and then just pull so that you can get the gloves off very easily. So I'm releasing it on my gloss off my wrist. So now once this is activated and you've mixed it, you're welcome to touch this with your fingers um, and you're ready to move on to the next step. So for our next step, we're going to be using the bezels that we've already cleaned and our mixed crystal clay and uh, placing the clay inside of the bezels. So you're going to just have to get uh, experienced with the um, right amount of clay that you'll need for each of the different um, bezels. And again, if you're doing production, you would actually weigh this so that you would know you would have an exact amount to place into a bezel like this and each time you would have just the right portion. So this clay is still really sticky, um, and if you do have really sticky clay, I highly recommend that you just wait um, 10 minutes and the clay will start to be less sticky. And we're gonna want to um, try to get enough clay so that this is uh, completely flat with inside of that bezel. So let's focus just on this one first. You'll pinch off a, a ball of the mixed crystal clay that has been colorized and um, place it inside of the bezel and then use your finger to pat it down and place it flush to the edges of the bezel. And 
I'm using my fingertips to push the clay this way and pull it this way um, and creating a nice smooth and flat surface. So as you saw, I just kind of guesstimated and I've been doing this enough that I made it look easy. But if you had way too much clay, what you would do is pinch off um, some of it. And um, if uh, you had not enough, you could add another little ball and, plat and pat it down until you had a nice flat surface. Once your bezel is filled, you'll take a wet wipe and uh, wipe away any of the crystal clay that might have gotten onto the surface of the bezel. You'll also want to make sure that your clay is, you know, evenly um, placed inside. So you can see that uh, I wanted to take a little bit more time because I had, can you see that I don't have quite the amount that I want right there. So I'll just go in and just pinch or push that clay right up to that edge. All right, so this looks pretty good. I'm gonna place that down. I'm gonna first wipe off my fingertips with my wet wipe because I had some of the clay on my fingers and I don't wanna get it onto the rest of the bezel. And then I'm going to wipe the sides of the bezel, the back of the bezel, anywhere that my fingerprints could have just been because I'm wiping away any of the crystal clay that could have gotten onto the surface. This will harden like uh, cement, so um, we're gonna clean it up as we go. So I used the wet wipe to cover up my fingernail and now I'm just going in along this, this edge and uh, cleaning up um, any potential uh, clay that could be on those side surfaces. You don't necessarily have to do too much of this right now, this step right here, um, because when we do press this uh, impression and make the impression, we could have some of that squeeze out and we'll have to clean up again. So, but that's an idea of what you're going to do for putting the clay into the bezel and cleaning it, making it nice and flat for our impression. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the mold that we have just created using the organics and um, we're going to put a little bit of mica powder inside of this and then make an impression. So before we do that I wanted to show you that I've done a little bit of work beforehand so that I can have an idea of exactly what that um, uh, mica powder is going to look like on this color of clay. Um, I've done these before and then I've recorded, I've kind of made a little cheat sheet for myself showing me what uh, all the different colors of the gold would look like because um, I have a lot of the Jacquard Pearl X powders. Um, so I chose all of the different golds. I chose um, the different colors that we have in the copper and in the silver to kind of create for myself a little cheat sheet and then then made a decision, recorded on the back side what color did the best. Um, and then uh, made a decision on which color that I wanted to use for this tutorial. So for this particular tutorial, we're using these two colors of the Jacquard Prolex powders uh, to create the impression into the clay. To make the mold, I'm using a silicon putty. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And once you activate this clay, you have a very short period of time to work with it and it allows you time to make an impression. I 
image that you would like to use uh, to make your impression. I just went out into the garden and gathered a variety of different leaves from various plants. I like to look for leaves that have a lot of definition in them because that shows up really nicely uh, when you press that down into the mold. Here's an example of a leaf that doesn't have very much definition, so that won't show up as much in the mold. Here's some examples of other types of leaves that would have a better chance. It's starting to become fall here, so the leaf selection. Here's other examples of um, leaves that will make really nice impressions because you can see how much uh, definition there are or there is on the back side of, of this leaf. Other things that you can use are grass. So this is a little bit of um, from our, my anise plant. Um, this makes a great mold and it's in fact what was used to make something like this. So select your organics. Um, I'm using mine when they're freshly uh, picked and not dried because it'll make it easier to embed into the silicone putty and press down. Other things that you can do um, is you could use uh, found objects. Um, this is a casting of a vintage button that I had and that is what it was used to make these pieces here. So you can use also vintage buttons or found objects um, you don't have to necessarily just use organics. I like to lay down a little piece of plastic to make it easy for me to work with the silicon molding putty and not have it stick to my surface. You're going to want to pull out, um, open up and pull out a ball. It's up to you about uh, what size you want to use, but I'm using bezels that are you know, fairly small, so I'm not going to need um, a huge amount uh, to make my mold. In fact, that might even be more than enough. So go ahead and um, open up the part A and part B of this silicon putty and pull out equal size balls. Looks like I have more of the B. So I'm rolling these into somewhat round balls so that I can see how close I am in. And this doesn't have to be really exact, but you want to try to make it as exact as possible. All right, so now that we have the silicone um, balls, before we do anything, we're going to take a, t a little bit of time and make sure that we have everything set up. Um, we're going to want to make sure that we have a good idea of the organics that we want to try to make the mold of, or you could make one with a button or something else. So I'm going to focus on using this, so I have that ready to go. Other things that you're going to want to have ready is some wet wipes because um, the silicone putty um, can get uh, oily and on your fingers. You'll also want to have some sort of way in which you can press down onto the clay and make a flat disc. So you could either use the top part of your silicone to press down. I dug through the kitchen and found this bowl so I can press down. There's no logo or anything on the bottom. It's just a nice smooth bowl so that I could show you when I'm pressing that down. So find some sort of flat surface that you can use to make your pressing on your putty to make it a flat, nice disc. Now I'm ready to mix my silicone molding putty and I have a very short window to work with this before it starts to harden and you can't make an impression on it. That's why I like to have everything ready. I, I have to tell you, I've had different people have different results um, and I don't know if it's because they didn't have the right size balls. Um, I don't know if it's a chemical thing that's happening uh, between their hands and the putty. If maybe there's some sort of, um, if you're on medications, it might speed up the process. But just know that you need to work fast with this. So that's why it's important to have your whole entire station set up prior to mixing. So how I like to work with this is I'll start to knead these together with my fingertips. And um, you want to mix them together until they're no longer marbled. 
I have tried all kinds of different ways between, you know, folding it over on top of itself in the palms of my hands and what I have found to be the best is by kneading it with my fingertips because I have uh, more control of making sure that it's fully blended. All right, you can see that I'm, I don't have any kind of marbling going on. So once I get to that point, I'm gonna bring it to the palms of my hands. I'm gonna roll it into a nice smooth ball. So that there's a limited amount of creases in it. If you can't seem to get those creases out, just put the creases to the best as your ability downside. And then you're gonna take, I have my bowl here, and I'm gonna press it into a nice flat patty. Now I'm not making it too incredibly flat. I still want it to be somewhat um, nice. So now I have a nice flat surface and I'm ready to, I have a little piece right here that's kind of funky, so I'm thinking about where that's gonna go as far as my design. I'm also thinking about, um, on this particular one, I'm going to be using it with a bale pendant, so that's why I put the leaf farther up on that design. And I'm just slightly pressing it down. I don't know if you can see that there. Now you're just gonna let your leaf stay inside of that putty until it is firm to the touch. So as you can see, these bezels that I'm working with, they have a bale. And so when I said I wanted to have my organic somewhat towards the top, it was taken into consideration that uh, distance that I'd have here. So when I make that impression here that uh, I have uh, enough of a, uh, an area up here to make this visually interesting. So on, when I've made molds before, you know, like on this one, I had a lot of putty up here, so I needed to trim it, so I just used a pair of scissors to cut that straight edge so that I could make an impression with that taking in consideration that bale. It didn't take much time at all. I would say um, even 10 minutes for this to be completely uh, firm to the touch. So when that's ready, you can just bend back the side and you can see that the organic will just peel right off. And now you have a nice impression that you can use for mixing your crystal clay and making an impression into and you know, onto the clay. For this next one, we're going to need our mold. I'm placing down a piece of plastic and we're going to need a Q-tip and then um, the various um, bezels that we filled with the crystal clay. And we're going to need to have our Perlex powders. Um, I have a gold and a silver. I think I'll start with the gold. So go ahead and open up your Perlex powders. I tend to like to open that up on the side just in case it um, gets all over. And let's just focus on this one right here. All right, so like I said, we're gonna take into consideration that this um, edge that we have on the mold and that when we make that impression, we're still gonna have plenty of space to keep in, uh, to make an impression and have room for that bale. If you don't have a lot of space on your mold, you might wanna cut it with a pair of scissors just to get it um, so that you do are able to take into consideration that area right there. What you're gonna to want to do is get a little bit of the Perlex powder on your Q-tip and smear it around into the base of your mold. And I'm going to use a wet wipe to remove it from this outside surface edge so that I can just have um, the Perlex powder on the mold itself and then on the pre in the impression and not on the sides right here.
All right, now I have my Perlex powder on my mold. Go ahead and put the lid back on. So now I have my bezel with the crystal clay in there and I have my mold and I'm ready to make my impression. So I'm taking into consideration the design of this and I'm going to want to try to have it to either be uh, either over to the side maybe a little bit or maybe right in the center. That's all kind of dependent on what it is that you like. So I find that it's easiest to just place this down onto the mold. And I'm trying to make sure that I have plenty of room for that bale, but yet I'm getting plenty of room for that impression. And you place your uh, finding down onto there. And then I'm picking it up and I'm just slightly pressing the back of the mold with my fingertips and I'm pressing down with my thumb to make a nice impression. Now this is where I was saying that if you had a lot of excess clay in there, it would squish out the sides. And if that's the case, we can clean this up. So let's see how we have done. So you'll peel back the mold. If your clay was really soft, it could very easily stick. Um, and you can see that um, I have a nice um, impression there. If I wanted to even have this be more of the leaf and um, less of the space up inside here, I can go ahead and cut a little bit of that away. I could have also placed this farther down on the bezel, um, but um, that's the overall impression that I, I have on my piece. And now I'm going to take a little bit of time to go in and soften this hard um, edge where you can see that the impression was. And um, I'm also pressing the crystal clay back into the bezel and away from that side edge. I'm also making sure that I'm staying kind of clear of that area where the mica powder is um, to not disturb it. You can also go in with a clean toothpick, getting it slightly wet, um, and go in there and, you know, uh, if you had some excess uh, mica powder that went over the sides here on this, on this area right here. So once you've gone in and um, kind of cleaned up your bezel, and go in with a wet wipe the same as we have done before and now we're really going to be particular about cleaning this side edge because um, we're just finishing up and we want to make sure that none of the crystal clay is on the side edges here. So let's just go ahead and say that we didn't like this impression altogether. What we could do is um, go ahead and um, uh, wipe it down all together and remove all that mica powder, pat down the surface, and then go ahead and reapply or retry to get the impression in there. Or let's say that you did wipe away some right here. You could go back in with a Q-tip and apply a little bit more of the uh, Perlex powders onto that edge where you had wiped away a little bit or maybe you didn't have, you know, a section of it. So some of the things that, you know, that you could have challenges with is if the clay sticks to the mold, uh, just go ahead and wipe it down and let the clay sit up a little bit more before you make the impression. That will also help clean up that um, stickiness. And that's what's sticking to the sides of the mold.
You could stop here and it uh, creates a really cool look such as this, but you will need to seal it or you can pour resin over the top to create an uh, interesting high gloss look like this. To create a glossy resin surface over the colorized crystal clay that you use a mold to make an impression into, you will want to mix up a batch of the Nundesign resin and then pour it over the surface. To mix the resin, you have to have a one-to-one -one ratio exactly of one tablespoon to one tablespoon. And you have to mix the full cup in order for the resin to be properly activated. So you want to fill up to the first one tablespoon, always with the part A, and then up to the second tablespoon, always with the part B. So I like to get down right next to my resin. So put it down on your work surface, um, covered area, and you're gonna pour in the part A. Go ahead and take the lid off. Then get right down next to the resin so you can see that line and know exactly when you've hit it. So I'm pouring, pouring, and my bottle is tilted quite a bit up so that I can have a heavy flow because I'm, I'm putting a lot of resin in. And then as it starts to get close to that line, I'm putting the base of the bottle down closer to the table and I'm waiting till I get right to that line. So I'll have a very thin flow. And as I hit that mark right where it's at, I'll go ahead and twist the top and I'll use one of my wet wipes to wipe away any resin that might have spilled. And so I have a nice clean top. And put my resin top back on. Go ahead and turn that corner over where that resin was and you're ready to pour the part B. So we're gonna do this one up to that two tablespoon mark of the parts B. So bring it right down to the surface. Pour, pour, pour. It's right to that line and as it starts to get to that line, I'm twisting my top, ending the flow, and I'm right at that two tablespoon mark. Go ahead and wipe away the excess resin that might be on there. Put the lid on. Now we're ready to time ourselves for two minutes. So I have my timer set for two minutes, and I'll go ahead and start. And with one of the stir sticks, I'm holding at the base of the resin. I'm putting the stir stick into the resin and this is a really full cup. So I'm just going slow and you'll start by rotating around the outside edges. You can see that the two parts get cloudy right away as they start to activate and come together. So I'm going around the outside edges. I'm also scraping the bottom of the cup. And then every now and then I'm gonna stop, pause, scrape the sides off to get the, all of that resin of part A and B back into the cup and then come back in, stirring. You can also rotate it around with your fingers holding it at the base. Up and scrape the sides. Scrape the stick back into the cup and keep going. So it's a minimum of two minutes, but what you're really watching out for is as these two parts, A and B, become more and more mixed they will get less cloudy. Don't worry too much about those bubbles inside of there because those will have ways to deal with. So I'm scraping the sides and the bottom. Scraping into the cup. And there's my timer. 
after your timer goes off and if you still don't have a nice uh, clear mixture, just continue to stir, rotating the cup, stirring, scraping the sides. And then as it starts to get very clear, go ahead and scrape off the top on the top part, mixing stick. And then I like to place mine into um, into either a cup or onto another piece of plastic and let that dry because I can reuse that stick over and over again. And as the resin sits, uh, it'll start to have the air bubbles come to the surface and they're, they'll expand and pop. Um, you can also place this under a nice lamp and the, the heat of the lamp will also make the bubbles pop. I highly recommend that you use a wood block or some sort of surface that you can hang the bezels onto so that you have a nice even surface. I went ahead and put a bit of tape onto my block as well. So if I have resin overflow, and it is easy to have resin overflow, especially when you're using this technique. So just plan for it. You'll put your pieces onto the wood block, such as like that, and then you will drizzle your resin right onto these pieces. On pieces that are much larger like this, it is easy to put like a coin behind the back of them, but uh, what I have found, um, I did many pieces and I didn't have any issues, but then on some pieces, I did have a challenge that I did have a little bit of overflow. I didn't see the overflow at all, but it did overflow and went underneath the coin. Oh my goodness. Houston, we have a problem. And now uh, I've let these set way too long <laughs> and I can't remove the coin off of the back side. So I had that happen on this piece and I had it happen also on this piece here. So let me just show you though, uh, one of the techniques for removing the resin. Let's pretend that that coin wasn't there, that we had it actually on the block. Um, and then we pulled it up. So let's just imagine we did have some overflow and that's what it would look like. Um, what you would do is take a pair of needle nose pliers. I just wanna show you how easy this is to actually remove that overflow. You just bend back the resin um, from the bezel and it just easily uh, peels away. So it's ideal to do this uh, in the uh, like around the 12 hour mark this is on almost 18 to 24 hours into the cure process but you can see that it just bends back really easily from the bezel and you can peel it off uh, so this would have been you know ideal but the coin is now the issue there has been some overflow that went underneath that coin and now these two pieces of metal are very nicely attached to one another and are not coming undone. So if this would have been on a, um, a piece of wood like this, um, this would have usually peeled off, um, especially if it's plate, if it has a piece of plastic down underneath there, this would have easily just popped off and then we could have removed that. So lesson learned, don't use the coins.